I've got two experiments online on my website, sheldrake.org, at the moment. Um, one of them is a joint attention test. And here I'm exploring something that I don't think anyone else has ever explored. It's, it's, um, the question is, if you have two people concentrating on the same thing at the same time, or nowadays with mass media, we can have millions of people concentrating, watching the same TV show, for example, watching the same football match, um, millions at the same time. Is there a kind of resonance between minds when people, you're watching the same thing as someone else? This hasn't got a standard scientific word. I, I call it joint attention. Mm. We, know, we know that joint attention, actually joint attention is established because when babies reach the age of about one, they become capable of joint attention. And it's a very important part of normal development. That, that's why with people with babies and toddlers, they go around and they say, doggy. And they say, oh yes, doggy. And, and you, it's joint attention on the same thing is essential for human development uh, proper. If, if people who don't have this turn out to be autistic very often. Uh, so it's about our shared uh, world. Anyway, in my joint attention test, um, you log on online and with another person um, in a separate place. And then there's a series of trials where in each trial you're shown a picture. Uh, you're just watching the screen, a picture appears. and at random, your partner may be showing the same picture or a different picture. There's yeah. a different pair of pictures for each test. Um, each trial lasts only 10 seconds. The whole, the whole test lasts three minutes. So um, then uh, what you're asked after 10 seconds, uh, one of the people is asked, was your partner looking at the same picture? Okay. And you click same, different. Mm -hmm. You're right or you're wrong. By chance, you'd be right 50% of the time. Yeah, yeah. In these experiments, it's coming out significantly above chance. It's not a very big effect, but it's very significant. Um, are we talking 55, 60? What are we talking we're about? We're talking, in this case, only about 53, 54. 50. But okay. with thousands of trials, it's, okay. very, it's, it's very significant. Yeah. Um, and anyway, I'm doing a new test at the moment, comparing different kinds of pictures. It seems to be working better when you're looking at pictures of faces than landscapes, for example, perhaps because it's oh, more engaging. interesting. So okay. anyway, that's one of my experiments, looking at a new phenomenon. And then, of course, I want to scale it up. What happens if you've got 10 people looking at the same thing? Yeah. 10, 50 or 100. And of course, you could do this live on TV as well, where you could do it with millions. Yes, yes. This would have an enormous effect in interpreting what's happening in modern culture, which involves huge amounts of joint attention. Yet yeah. this is completely unexplored because the standard materialist assumption in science is that minds are nothing but brains and they're insulated inside heads. So what you're thinking and looking at has no effect on me at a distance because that's impossible. Your mind's nothing but the physical activity of your brain. The second experiment that I'm running, which I invite people to take part in, is an experimental test of telephone telepathy. More than 80% of the population say that they've had exper uh, the experience of thinking of someone who then rings. And they say, that's funny, I was just thinking about you. Mm -hmm. Or they just know who it is when the phone rings before they've looked at the caller ID or answered it at the phone. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very common experience. Um, it works especially well with people who know each other well. Telepathy is about people who are bonded socially. Now, for a hundred years or more since the invention of the telephone, people have observed this. But the so-called skeptics, the dogmatic skeptics, have said, oh, well, it's impossible that it's really telepathy. That can't happen because minds are just inside brains. Uh, it's impossible for them to have an influence at a distance. It's nothing but coincidence and selective memory. You remember when you're right, you forget when you're wrong and so on. Anyway, I've developed a test to test that. And how the test works is you register on my website, sheldrake.org. You put in the names of two friends or family members, people you know well, and their telephone numbers. The computer then, at a randomized time, picks one of these two people at random, calls them up. So say I was doing the test and you were one of my callers. Yeah. Say my wife, Jill, was the other one. Um, 
you'd get a call saying, this is Rupert's telephone telepathy test. Please think about Rupert. When you're ready, press one. You press one. My phone then rings. The caller ID says telephone telepathy test. It says one of your two callers is on the line right now waiting to speak to you. Press one for Alan, press two for Jill. So I then say who I think it is out of these two people. And as soon as I've guessed that's recorded on that database, the line opens up and I get instant feedback as to whether I'm right or wrong. And then I can talk for up to a minute. It cuts off after a minute because I'm paying for the call. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, this test um, is giving, you know, very significant positive results. In, in my earlier versions of the test, I had four callers and there the chance rate's 25%. And we were getting uh, rates, average rates of about 45%, you know, with hundreds wow. of massively significant statistically. Yeah. And this, so this, uh, what I'm trying to do at the moment is to find out if people can get better at this by practice. And if yes. so, how they practice, how they can develop their intuition. So what I'd like to say to anyone listening to this is that if you're in the US, Canada or UK or Italy, the test doesn't work anywhere else at the moment, um, then check it out. Try it with your friends. It doesn't take very long, uh, about 10 minutes of your time to do one of these tests, spray spaced over an hour and a half or a couple of hours. And um, this, uh, if uh, I'm inviting people to try and find how to train their intuition, yes. I don't know how to train it. I'm not that good at these things. I score above chance, but I'm not brilliantly intuitive. So I'm asking other people to help with this. Um, and in fact, it could turn into a competition. Who's got the best intuition? Yeah, yeah a global competition. And well, it could end up with, it could even end up, if people find they can practice and get better at it, it could even end up with a telepathy Olympics. Olympics. Uh, Who's the most telepathic yeah. person in the world? Yeah. Um, and then I think when we get to that stage, all these boring old skeptics who just say, yeah. oh, it's possible, <laughs> the evidence isn't there, it doesn't exist. This would, I mean, they'd still exist, but they'd become like the Flat Earth Society. They're yeah. just fringe group. They are a fringe group anyway, but they pretend they speak for the, for the science establishment. They don't really, but they pretend to. Anyway, here's a wow. way for wow. doing experiments. Yeah, yeah, this... Yeah, that 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 your what you just summarized there with the joint attention study and the telephone telepathy study was basically the essence of what I was getting at with actually when you plant a flag beyond the edge and then further is you actually you yourself create the tests to further prove the hypothesis and then try and inspire other people around the world to not only create, not only participate in your test, but also create their own tests to try and prove these hypotheses. And also, I actually really appreciated the, I think the structure of the two that you spoke about, it's very important. First of all, the joint attention study, I, I really like how for both of them that you can crowdsource people from around the world. Well, US, UK, and uh, Australia, and, it and Italy. Italy, that's the telephone one. The joint attention test works everywhere. So it works everywhere. Mm. So, so this, is, this is a big deal, because if you can get people from India and Brazil and Russia and all these other countries around the world that, are, that, can, that can do the uh, jo you know, joint attention one and beyond. Let's see if we can get people around the world doing these. I appreciate how, I think the structure, Rupert, that you were describing as a, somebody that is also a fellow science scientist, science advocate, science communicator. Um, it's just for me to, uh, for me to view the, the style of your experiments, it sounds quite robust. And in the sense of, um, uh, 
even getting even getting small incremental differences of training intuition you can't you can't pick up a basketball and just walk onto a court and start shooting three pointers you can't pick up a violin and just start playing mozart you 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 have to train your intuition you have to train these telepathic abilities in order for you to bump up like if in that example where there's you know four in telephone telepathy if there's four options of my four friends and if on my rate is only supposed to be 25 but if i'm hitting 45 that's significant and that's also a big deal if i'm um slowly trying to compete if i'm becoming the united states best uh, most intuitive telephone telepathist and then i'm competing against the united kingdoms and germany's and and china's and i think that's a very interesting style of of trying to you know if if rupert if we can take that flag beyond the edge of what's known. And if we can incentivize people to partake through a sports style, Olympic style um, process, like what you're teaching, I think that's also very fun and it, it's engaging. And also the joint attention thing has a lot to do with the modern day, uh, we're approaching all 8 billion people soon to be connected on the planet. And if you can release a piece of content and then watch how people watch the content and if they can tell if they're if other people that they're engaging with if this person if if Rupert is also watching the um the advancement that's been made in biotech or if Rupert's watching the advancement that's being made in blockchain and cryptocurrency and then I pick which one Rupert's you know watching and I think that's very interesting given the fact that all 8 billion people are now, we can, there's a collective zeitgeist that's happening all the time with this pacer of the cycle of media. Absolutely. Well, I think this is, it's, that's why I think it's so topical at the moment, the whole question of joint attention. There's never been a capacity for so many people to have so much joint attention. And now, everyone agrees, of course, that we're interlinked through the internet and through news media and through radio and television and so forth. Um, but the big blockage to these inquiries within institutional science is this materialist assumption the mind's nothing but the brain. And that's why no one's doing research on this. Um, it's also one reason why I've, uh, I, mean, I like doing research in the public domain. And I like doing it outside universities and where anyone can take part. But it, it's yeah. also that I'm forced to work that way because these subjects are so taboo. There's almost no university where you could actually do this research and hold down a job. And, you know, the, because the, the opposition to these things is, is very, very strong from dogmatic materialists. I mean, most ordinary people are not opposed. Most ordinary people are interested in these phenomena. But within the academic world, there is this problem of dogmatic materialism. Anyway, I tried just to get a go, go on doing research and, and get on with these experiments. And luckily, yes. there's enough people who participate uh, for the results to come in. 